see if I can get um, the PowerPoint to work here. Technology. Um, it reminds, sorry, reminds me of actually, I once had to give a talk at uh, an introduction to new faculty members at York uh, about how to teach with technology. That was a ver my most interesting talk so far because the technology didn't work at all. <laughs> Anyways, so um, my research centers around 3D user interfaces and uh, the simplest way to answer the question in terms that you can easily understand is Iron Man 2, right? Because a lot of people have seen Iron Man 2, and there is beautiful sequences with uh, uh, 3D user interfaces in there. And so I'll just, yep, skip this slide. There we go. And I hope the movie plays right now. Okay, so uh, I'll call upon your imagination here. Uh, this is actually just a picture of the movie here. What he does at that point is he basically has the, some his magical um, computer system scan in a physical object, and then he basically lifts it up like he's standing right there, lifts it up, puts it up in the air, and then modifies it, rotates it, and uh, takes buildings away, and basically rediscovers an atom that his dad basically pre prepared for him. I'm sorry that I can't show you the movie clip here. We tried it before, and it worked, but never mind. So, but it's a general 3D user interface, and you have seen Similar scenes, for example, in Minority Report, there's the scene where he has the video sequences and he stands there and does all kinds of things with his fingers and like this. And people go like, wow, this is the f f interface of the future. And I think about that and I go like, yes, cool, this looks cool, this looks really, really nice, but can we make it work? After, at the end of the day, I'm a researcher, I have to make things work if I want to test them, if I want to see if they really work. So, um, well, Let's look at real examples for 3D user interfaces. So on this slide, I have six different examples. On the top right, if we start with that one, it's an application called Google SketchUp that allows you to draw your own 3D content, in this case, a kitchen. And that's one of the most interesting examples for me in recent years because what it has done is what traditional is available in AutoCAD and high-end CAD applications that have very, very, very complex user interfaces and made it radically simpler Talk to architects these days. They're all over uh, Google SketchUp these days. They all use it because it's so much simpler. So we see some progress there. On the top left, you see some classic 3D visualization. The interaction there is usually, OK, you can fly around this uh, data set that visualizes, I think, rainfall in this case. Uh, and that's about as much as you can do. So you can fly around it, but you can't touch it. Right? And a lot of content these days is like that. Oh, you, we can see it, but we can't modify it. Whereas Google SketchUp, you can actually play with it. So you can actually develop your own ideas. Um, in the middle, on the top, you have a classic virtual reality user interface. Helm was already pointing to that, so I'm not going to say much more to that. Uh, on the bottom left, you see one of the things that a lot of people th think about when, they, when I talk about a 3D user interface, that's a 3D desktop user interface, a 3D window manager or whatever you want to call it. In this case, case uh, Looking Glass by Sun. And it looks very nice. It looks very sexy, you know, the CDs popping up instead of your titles uh, and so on. But can you actually read something in this? I have a little bit of a problem with that because I can't read what's on the left window. Yeah, I can see there's a window and there is something in there and I can may be able to recognize what's in there, but that's about as far as I can go. In the middle on the bottom, you see something that's much more serious application. That's now medical applications where you have 3D, true 3D data sets, like the inside of a head. Right? And uh, the surgeon goes like, well, I should be drilling here and not there, right? because otherwise you can't walk anymore, <laughs> that kind of thing. So that's a much more serious application. Um, and that's actually one of the true 3D applications that I know that are really, 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 really 3D, because there you actually have basically the inside of the skull, and you need to be able to manipulate anything inside that skull. True. On the bottom right, is one of the most interesting examples from the game community. I mean, I could mention Halo Forge as one example for a 3D editor that most Halo players will be very uh, uh, um, familiar with. On the bottom, but on the bottom right, I've picked here the Spore editor that's in a game called Spore by Electronic Arts. And that's one of the best examples for a 3D editor that is usable by lots of people. If you have encountered this game, you will know exactly what I talk about because you can create your own creatures. And you can create your own creatures within very wide bounds. I have seen snails in the form of the text hello. Uh, and you know, 
birds that are really an elephant and all kinds of things. And it, gives, it just allows you to explore. It just allows you to do the many different things. So this is what we see today. And on the other hand, we have this dream of, well, we just take the data and go like this and manipulate it. Yeah, so what's real? What can we make work in between? So that's part of my work to try to figure this out. And I'll talk a little bit about this. But first, I'll tell you the user interface community's reaction to films such as Minority Report. So I'll read this in case you can't read it yourself. So two guys coming out of the movie Minority Ro Report. Mate, that film was brilliant. I reckon that interface will be the interface of the future in the year 2099. I'm sorry, ma'am, your cognitive scores are incredible, but you simply don't have the upper body strength to do this eight hours a day. <laughs> So that brings us to one of my first observations at this point is, how many people do you know that work like this eight hours a day? <laughs> yes, conductors, but they will happily drop their arm to the side after a little while when they get tired. <laughs> yes, very good. All right, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the technologies here so you understand the problem a little, be little bit better. Uh, top left, we have what's known as a, a basically as a 3D mouse. Uh, and this device is very nice. It's basically you grab this knob and you can push, pull, twist it uh, in all directions. And that's cool, except you can pull it about one millimeter. So the first user experience with this one is you touch it, the object flies off the screen. And you go like, what just happened? And then you don't know how to undo it. So uh, it's also a very, very, very sensitive device. Uh, so that's one of the problems with it. There's other problems with it, but I'm not going to go there. On the top right is some 3D tracking system. And, you know, your Wiimote is one example. Uh, another is this uh, cam two cameras basically using infrared light and reflecting the infrared light. And that image tells you where this object is in space. You basically need two cameras, then you can tell where it is in space. Lots of different technologies around that. Just one implementation. These are actually work fairly well. And that's what I, for example, use in my research a lot of times to actually figure out where your hand are, hands are or where your head is, right? Uh, the limitations with these things is that they have things like noise, so they jitter a little bit. So if, even if I put it right here, right, if I put the tracker right here, it will tell me it's moving a little bit, right? Uh, so there are some technical limitations around this. Precision is not great. If you want to detect rotations very accurately, you quickly run into problems because you need large things to detect uh, rotations accurately and so on. On the bottom left, you have the Wiimote as a prototypical modern gaming input device. And yes, you, I'm going to get this question, so I might as well answer it in, in, preemptively. Um, the Wiimote kind of revolutionized a lot of the gaming business. Uh, and now we have two new competitors coming out, right? The Sony Move system and the Microsoft Connect. My personal bet, and I'll go on record with this, is the Sony Move, because I see very few people playing like this for five hours. Whereas the kids have quickly figured out that can you play with the Wiimote like this, which is faster and more precise. So my bet is on the Sony, because the Sony is more like in that direction. Um, but uh, that's basically the cheapest 3D tracking system that you can find today. Um, on the bottom right is a traditional game controller. And people who have spent hundreds and thousands of hours playing games can do wonders with it. With it. Uh, my son just beats me every time. Uh, <laughs> never mind. Uh, but it is not a very good input device for a lot of tasks that you quickly want to do. It is a highly, highly, highly trained skill. But if you talk, ask closer to, to give you some ideas about this, if you ask people at Xbox gamers, for example, or it doesn't really matter if Xbox or not, all the controllers, uh, if, if somebody plays the same game on a mouse setup, they usually beat them fairly soundly. So that alone shows me that it's not an ideal input device. Okay? So let's talk about something on the output side. On the top left, we have our prototypical stereo glasses. Looks like a set of sunglasses, yes, but you put these on in the cinema, and suddenly you see Avatar in 3D. And it's awesome. Um, yes, but I'll point out, I mean, here my personal opinion about 3D movies is the following. 3D movies are great, but they're good movies when they're good movies. And how do you know that? You watch them in 2D. And Avatar was a good movie. 
there's lots of bad movies that have been 3D movies. So that's for me kind of the ultimate ratio. Um, uh, uh, the, the critical uh, Occam's razor for detecting if it's actually a good movie or not. Right? If it works in 2D, then it was a good movie. <laughs> Anyways, so the problem with these sunglasses are they're very nice, but you don't like to wear them all day long. And especially they have some insidious side effects. If you look with, if you have them on and you look at your monitor, you can't see your monitor. Your laptop monitor, you know, LCD panel, you can't see it. So it's useless in that context. When you look at somebody else wearing the glasses, you can't see their eyes. And, you know, we are humans. What do we look at when we talk to another person? Except if we're a geek. Uh, <laughs> we look at the other person's eyes, right? So that's kind of why people don't like to wear them all day long. We can, of course, go even more techy. In the middle of the picture, in the top, left part of the middle, there is the augmented reality helmet or the virtual reality helmet that you put out. That typically blocks your complete vision. And uh, one of the problems with them is they lead to neck strain because they're heavy. Uh, I mean, even if it's just 500 grams, uh, that usually causes neck strain. And so people don't like to wear them. We force people to wear them in experiments when we analyze if this actually works. But people don't like to wear them. On the top right is, even more in the future, this is a true 3D display. And it's a pretty cool thing. It's actually glowing points in space. And that's an awesome technology for an idea. But it has one fundamental problem. You see the front and the back of the object at the same time. And if there's two heads behind each other, you see the front and the back and the front and the back of all of them. And it gets really hard for your brain to actually figure out what you're seeing. I'm, so the idea of the hologram in Star Wars or in other movies is a great idea, but we don't really know how to make this work. Well, actually, I know of two systems that kind of allow you to do this but they're barely, out, barely in the research stage, nowhere near that you can buy them. I hope that we have them in the future. I want one of them tomorrow. Well, actually, today. But I can't seem to get one. Um, bottom left uh, points to the fact that uh, we actually are not tunnel vision. Most of the helmets and technologies, even with the sunglasses and everything, is kind of like tunnel vision. So you are asked to navigate in a virtual world or do something, you know, um, drive or whatever with this field of view. Well, if you actually look into definitions, if you have a vision impairment that your field of view is that wide, you are not legally allowed to drive. <laughs> Why? Because people have found you crash into things and you lose your way. You can't navigate. So we want wide field of view devices. I mean, I can give you a, a virtual reality helmet that has a wide field of view, but you're going to pay $100,000 for it. So it's a trade-off here. Right? So it's not quite that easy. On the bottom right, we also have problems with resolution. So who can read the text at the top of the cube? So this points to an interesting fact, namely that if you think of you can display more information in 3D, this is not necessarily true. This is exactly the counterpoint here. You can't read that text at all. It's useless. There is no information at that point anymore. Right? So displaying things in 3D is not necessarily always better. Let's talk about humans. So the first thing is, how many professions do you know that actually do true 3D spatial navigation? OK, I'll put the picture there so you kind of have one astronaut. I know of a few more, deep sea divers, night, night diving in particular, uh, is a very dangerous profession. All of these professions have the property that they need hundreds and thousands of hours of training before you can do anything useful. So the notion that a lot of people have that, oh, you can just fly through the space is great. And I love this notion. I want to do it myself. The problem is your brain is not wired to actually do this because you have no experience in it. And those people who actually do it need a lot of training to be able to do it. And I'm not, you know, not talking a little training. Just talk to astronauts, how much training they have. Just talk to night divers, how much training they need right, to get there. Um, and if we do th true 3D things like build a building, we typically help ourselves by building things like scaffolding. Because it's much easier to do it that than just build it in free space. Right? So it often helps if you have something to lean on or construct around. 
And then I'll also ask the question, how good are we truly at spatial navigation? So I put a little map of the world up here. I'll point to north. I'll say this is north. That's about correct here. And then I ask you all to point to, say, Europe. So where is Europe? Please point. OK, most of us are pointing that way. And that's about right, except that I strongly believe it's down there. Yeah. Ah, yes, the Earth is round, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right? The, what I'm just pointing out is you, even your, you know, things you know, you're not taking into account when you ask questions about spatial relationships. Right? We're just not used to navigate in space all the time. Right? So, anyways, then we can fool our visual system. Our visual system is not is great, but not that great. So the bottom left is an optical illusion around the sense of depth, how far people are away. This is basically a room that's not straight, but heavily small on one side, so it looks, wait a second, the kid is bigger than the adult. Wait a second, that can't be, right? So um, it's just an optical illusion. And then we have peculiar habits. The picture in the bottom uh, in the middle is somebody going through extreme contortions uh, to reach something. And why are they doing that? Because one of the things that humans really, really want to do is when they work with their hands, they want to see their hands. And they want to see what they're touching. A lot, lot of people don't like to do this. They will actually bend down and look. Most people will, in fact. And so we actually like to see what we touch. That has a lot of re uh, Im uh, implications for user interfaces. Bottom right uh, is very simple. Um, if we talk about interacting with systems, one of the things that you basically you are most used to is a mouse or some pointing device. But a pointing device is like the tip of a pen. So if I am asked to now manipulate this with the tip of my pen, I get into problems, right? Because I, you know, if I do it with my hand, it's really easy. Right? My hand is a very nice instrument that can do lots of different things. But manipulating everything with a mouse? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. So we, we ask ourselves to do a lot of things with very impoverished input devices sometimes. So can we do that? So now let's go into talk about some research. And I'm going to just talk about one little piece of research here. I'm doing much more along these lines. We do stupid things. I like to ask my students questions to reinvestigate how well does, do things truly work. So on the top bottom, you, uh, sorry, on the top row, you see the prototypical mouse, just a mouse. And on the right, you have the contestant, a 3D input disk system. So what we did is the following. We mounted the trackers, the, the green thing there uh, with the three feelers sticking out. We mounted the tracking system onto a mouse. And we just asked the question, if we use a 3D tracking system to simulate a mouse, how do things come up? So we did this actually in the, in the context of a 3D task, because you know, if a 2D task, that's boring. Uh, let's do it in a 3D task. And we asked people to slide objects around in this environment. And we have some magic in the background here, some smart 3D manipulation technologies that basically do the following. They make objects always stay in contact so that you can just slide the object to the destination and it just magically stays, stays there. Similar to how you do drag and drop on a 2D desktop interface. Very similar to that. It works like that. That's the easiest way for me to explain what this does. So we tried this. And we did, uh, we did the following. We had five, five conditions. We had the mouse. We had the tracker on a desk. We tried it in the air. So we actually moved the tracker into the air. So see if there's any effect of the supporting surface, right? Because there's a surface there. And we tried it in the larger area. Uh, and then we tried it in 3D. Um, and this is basically the typical result I get out of these studies. The mouse, hands down, wins. Shortest time on average, perfect. All the tracker systems take slower, even if they work as if I work a mouse. So basically, I'm just using the tracker as a 2D system, like as if it is a mouse. All I'm getting is 2D coordinates. And still, it's slower. And then if we go into 3D, things get slower still. That's typical result that we see. So um, smart 3D, out of this study, we got the insight. Smart 3D is faster than full 3D. 
Well, in a sense, that's not that surprising because controlling more degrees of freedom is harder and less precise. Uh, so you lose, typically. But a couple of surprises. Wait a second. So if I move a mouse on a desk and if I move a mouse in the air, it's about the same time. Interesting. We also found that the mouse was really different from a tracker. And in follow-up studies, we found out that this is truly the case because there's technological differences between the mouse. The mouse is a very, 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 very good input device. It has low latency. It's really quickly to send you the updates. The tracker takes longer because of the way the technology works. So now let's make things better. Let's, I've talked a lot about the context. I've analyzed a lot of the factors. Now let's make things better based on the things that we learn. So the first thing is I say uh, no floating objects. Well, OK, we can make, we can have, no worries, we can have floating objects, but they should be the exception. So if you want to make something float, you have to do something special. By default, everything is connected to something else. Look around you. How many objects do we have in this room that float? Hmm, OK, here, <laughs> right, for a second. But the default, no floating objects. If you look into most 3D systems, everything floats by default. The default is wrong. It's just wrong. Then we like things like collision avoidance because people really like to do things, use the surfaces of the object to actually bring them into contact. So I can actually slide this object here and position it here by using the surfaces. So collisional avoidance, collision detection, and sliding behaviors really make a difference. And then I challenge the notion of a cursor. So this little gray cube there, if you look carefully, the cursor is actually technically speaking over the second step not the front surface, but the second surface, right? And, but the cube is in front. And we found that this works better. And the reason is very interesting. There is experiments from human, uh, from, sorry, perception in primates, so not in humans, but in primates, in, in monkeys, basically, uh, that when you have something in your hand, and even if it's a pen, what happens is that people don't look at the tip of the pen but the monkey actually looks at the hand and the pen, at the whole pen. So you're looking at the whole object. So we actually made our systems work by using the whole area of the object, and that's why we put it in this case in the front and not in the back, because we're using the whole um, area of the object. So there's no cursor anymore at this point. It's the area that actually matters. That's a radical notion. It's not a point, it's an area. Um, so I hope this video works. Uh
what we find is when we give the people the task of actually sliding objects around and they magically stay in contact with everything else, people are much faster at doing everything else. Uh, it just works. One simple way to explain this is the following way. Uh, forget all, all the timings and error data that we collect in the experiment. We count the number of unprintable words. The condition where everything just works, very few. The conditions that are prevalent every, everywhere today, lots of swear words. So what I'm pointing out is with smart 3D technologies, we can get a lot. And we can get a lot of the, work, the, the dream of 3D user interfaces to work really well. And that's where I'm going. Thank you.